But for this evening, please, turn with me, if you will, to the Gospel of St. Luke, Luke 23. Verse 44. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour, because the sun was obscured and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus was crying out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. It becomes dark. And as most of you know, this darkness that took place from 12 to 3 fulfilled the prophecies of Amos chapter 8, that the sun would set at noon. Now we've explained this many times. This could not be an eclipse. <coughs> it was the 14th of Nisan. It was Passover. It could not be a solar or a lunar eclipse. It was the wrong phase of the lunar month for it to be an eclipse. It was one of the times when God supernaturally intervenes with time. Uh, my apologies to those who've heard me say this 15 times. Uh, in the book of Joshua, a day went from 24 hours to 48. Okay. In the book of Revelation, a day will be reduced from 24 hours to 16. Okay. In the healing of King Hezekiah, the life of one king of the Jews was extended because God made the sun go back because it was counterbalanced by the premature death of another king of the Jews. In other words, the death of Jesus balanced the, <laughs> the celestial calendar for the prolonged longevity miraculously given to King Hezekiah. God made the sun go back, therefore God made the sun go forward. It could not be an eclipse. God intervenes with time. Now by time here, I, I don't mean chronos, in order of events. I only mean kairos, the clock, okay? That which is based on, on celestial motion, planetary motion, okay? At certain times, God intervenes with time, okay? You know, God can do anything. Oh, I'm so busy. Why did God only create 24 hours in a day and seven days in a week? Lord, I need more time. Well, you can do anything, Lord. Well, he did do it. <laughs> there, were, there were times when he did do it. <laughs> but, but they were the exception, not the norm. Okay? And he did do it. But they were the exception. They were not the norm. And there's more to come in the book of Revelation when God will actually intervene in time with planetary motion. Remember, Kairos, as opposed to Kronos, which is an order of events, Kairos <coughs> always depends on the second heaven. The first heaven is the atmosphere of the earth. The second heaven is out of space. Paul says he was taken up to the third heaven, which is eternity. And so we see when Jesus comes back, the Shemaim, the heavens, the Uranus in Greek, are rolled up like a scroll. The second heaven is taken out of the way, so there's no time. Eternity meets us. Time is taken away like a scroll. Time depends on the second heaven, on planetary motion. Okay. Now again, most of you have heard our teaching on Amos 8, where we go into this in some depth. Be that as it may, you have this darkness. <coughs> And this darkness will transpire again at the end of the age, as we'll be looking at tomorrow. But God intervened with time here. He did something. It became dark, totally dark when Jesus hung on the cross. What I'd like to look at tonight is this reality. Work while you have the light. Night comes, no man can work. When men cannot work, God is working. When the darkness comes and we can't do anything, Isaiah described a time when the Lord tells his people to come hide for a while. <laughs> when we can do nothing, it's because God is doing something that only God can do. Okay? 
There's no darkness in him. God is doing something only God can do. Now, the way we understand this is in the crucifixion. The crucifixion. We see the temple veil was torn here in Luke's Gospel. What I'd like to look at tonight, please turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 18. And verse 24. Now a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus and he was mighty in the scriptures. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. And he began to speak out boldly in the synagogues, and but when the Pharisees, um, but when, I'm sorry, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wanted to go across to Achaia, the brethren encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he had arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he demonstrated powerfully, refuting the Jews in public, demonstrating by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ, that Yeshua was the Messiah. Okay. As we always point out, when you have the Greek word eudeoi, you have an automatic problem in translation. The word can mean different things in different contexts. Anti-Semites have taken that word out of context in John's Gospel to make it seem like Christianity is to be an anti-Semitic religion. The word eudeoi and its variants can mean somebody who is Jewish. Apollos was Jewish. Jesus was Jewish. So we're not talking about anti-Semitism. These people are Jewish themselves. Secondly, it can be a member of the religious establishment, the Sanhedrin, or one of the religious parties, particularly the Pharisees and Sadducees. That could be the second meaning, depending on the context. Third possible meaning, in certain places in the Gospels, it was a geographical term designating the Jews of Judea from the Jews of Galilee, from the Galileans from the Judeans. It could mean one of those three things, but there are passages like this one where it means two of those things. Apollos himself was an ethnic Jew, but he was up against the religious establishment. Whenever you see this term Jew, understand as a generic term, we can't think of it as having a monolithic meaning. It can have more than one meaning. We must note the context Carefully, what is it talking about? Is it talking about somebody who's just Jewish? Is it talking about a member of the religious establishment? Were those controlled by them? Were the religious parties? Or is it talking about a Judean as opposed to a Galilean? Alexandria was the intellectual center of the eastern half, the Greek-speaking half of the Roman Empire at that particular time. It was a place where the Gnosticism that would later threaten the church in the post-apostolic era, in the patristic era, third, fourth century, was already coming into Judaism with somebody called Philo. It was also a place where East met West. Babylonian religions, Buddhist monks, people like this came as far West as Alexandria and had interaction with the early Christians and the Desert Fathers and things like this, from where institutions such as monasticism initially began to develop, okay? Alexandria was an important place. It had a huge influence on the Jews and on the Christian church. 
It's where the Septuagint had been translated, where the Hebrew scriptures were put into the lingua franca, into the Greek language, okay? He comes from there, and it says he was an eloquent man. Now, the idea of eloquence is indicative of a person of education. He was a person of education. Let's look at this aspect. I've said it before, but it is appropriate to highlight it again because it's in the text. Look with me, please, to Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Now, as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. They were uneducated by the standards of the Jewish world, not by the standards of the popular culture of the Greco-Roman world. In the Greco-Roman world, with a 25% slave population alone, literacy, and even numeracy, but certainly literacy, was the reserve of the nobility, the reserve of imperial powers, royalty, the reserve of military commanders and of pagan priesthoods. It was the reserve of the Senate and the Roman aristocracy and so forth, and of the Areopagites, the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers in Greece, particularly in Athens. Literacy was not common for everyone in the Roman Empire, except among the Jews. The Levites had to make sure that every Jew was literate and numerate to practice their religion. Every Jew had to be able to read the Torah and had to be able to count, okay, and multiply and divide and have basic arithmetic ability. Um, so it does not mean that they were illiterate or, or, or primordial. It just meant by the standards of the Jewish community, they were that. To this day in the Jewish community, you will normally find a higher stress on the importance of education than you will in the non-Jewish community. You know, what a high school education is in the States, or what, it, say, an A-level is in Britain, um, a bachelor's degree would be the basic minimum for a Jewish person, you understand? At least being a university graduate would be the basic for the average Jewish person. Uh, that's just, has something that has ancient roots to it, but that's the way it is. Uh, those who were formally educated, the religious establishment, however, marveled at them as having been with Jesus. Remember, you cannot be with Jesus and not get smarter. We are told in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it's easier for simple people to get saved than clever ones. It's easier for uneducated people to get saved than educated ones. It's easier for poor people to get saved than wealthy ones. It's easy for disenfranchised people to get saved than people of power. That is true, because people who do not have privilege, education, wealth, etc., they have less grounds for pride and self-sufficiency. It's easier for them to respond to the gospel. They can be very simple when they get saved. In fact, the odds are in their favor of getting saved, as opposed to a person who is, in a human sense, more clever. However, as simple as they may be, if they walk with Jesus, they don't stay that way. When you see a Christian yobo, there is something wrong with that person's relationship with the Lord and or with their church. The scriptures say, study to show yourselves approved. Study to show yourselves approved. Now, that's particularly true of leadership, but it's true of all believers. If you don't study God's word, God does not approve of you. Well, that's quite a standard, isn't it? I have seen a move of God taking place in Europe and in Great Britain, including Scotland at Calder Crooks and Montrose and these places, among the traveling people, among the gypsies, among Romanies. And I've known a number. In their 40s, 50s, and 60s, they were functionally illiterate. Within a year, 
after becoming believers, they're reading the scripture. You cannot have a relationship with Jesus and not get smarter as a result. Study to show yourself approved. God does not approve of people who don't study. You see the people running around with the pseudo-spirituality, I have a word, the Lord gave me a picture, and the Bible just becomes something, you know, that's either an ornament or that they carry with them to church or something that they read one or two verses out of context or just at most read it devotionally. They don't study it. God does not approve of these people. He does not approve of their discipleship. They do not have divine approval. Much more so if it's leaders, elders, pastors. He doesn't approve of them. You will get smarter. Now this becomes a problem. It's a problem that John Wesley recognized in Great Britain. He realized that the gospel and its impact on British society would engender higher levels of education and material affluence because biblical principles were applied to the economy and, and culture and things of this nature. And he realized that it, it would make a middle-class church that would lose its capacity to reach the working classes. Well, he was absolutely right. You create a social barrier. That's why evangelism is the lifeblood of the church. The middle class has to be servants of the working class if you want to get anywhere. John Wesley correctly understood this. Nonetheless, the apostles became upwardly mobile. However, the second generation of leaders who God raised up after the apostles, Stephen, of course, was martyred, but Barnabas, Paul, Rabbi Shaul of Tarsus, okay, Apollos, these were formerly educated men. The next generation of leaders that God raised up after the first generation were people of formal education. Now, God is sovereign and can do what he wants. He can take a, 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 a shoemaker to write the Pilgrim's Progress, or he can take William Carey and use William Carey to translate the scriptures into the Hindi language in India. He, he can do that in our cases where he's done things like that. But most of the people God has used to do those things, be it even Luther before he lost his marbles, or certainly in, 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 in William Tyndale and, and, and John Wycliffe, the, these were educated men. These were educated men, okay? The next generation were more educated than the previous one. If you see a movement where that's not happening, that's a movement that is already in decline. <laughs> that's a movement that is already in decline. Okay. It should be becoming more upwardly mobile, you know? Um, well, let's look at this a bit further. In 1 Peter, Peter writes at the end of the epistle, that the untaught and unstable will distort the scriptures to their own destruction. A classical example of this, of course, will be the Jehovah's Witnesses. They're untaught, they're unstable, and they distort the scriptures to their own destruction. At least the other false religions and cults have the sense of trying to gain some kind of academic credibility. The Mormons have Brigham Young University, the Catholics have Notre Dame University, the Jews have Jews College, Oxford. The, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses are anti-education. <laughs> the untaught and unstable will distort the scriptures to their own destruction. Okay. But then Peter goes on to say, these complicated things, let Paul explain them. Paul is a rabbi. Paul is a Latin and Greek speaking intellectual. He was a disciple of Rabbi Gamaliel. Let Brother Paul explain these things according to the wisdom given him. <coughs> Notice the humility of Peter. He had no problem saying that Paul is an educated man and he is better equipped to handle these things than I am. I like his humility. 
But notice Paul's humility. I'm the least of the apostles. <laughs> I persecuted the church. I wasn't around from the baptism of John. Some people have the mistaken view that the apostles shouldn't have chosen Matthias by lots. They should have waited for Paul to come. That's nonsense. If you read Acts 1, one of the qualifications was you had to be around from the baptism of John, John the Baptist, Yohanan Amatbil. John was the pivotal character, the last figure of the old covenant and the first of the new. He was transitional. Paul couldn't have qualified. I'm the least of the apostles. I wasn't one of the original. Now, he was equal in authority. He wrote of the Last Supper as if he was present. I received from the Lord that which I delivered unto you. He was somehow raptured the way John was in Revelation. He had a similar experience in 2 Corinthians. He got his doctrine directly from Jesus. He saw the Lord. He had co-equal authority with Peter and James and John and Matthew and so forth. But in stature, he counted himself as the least. Paul's formal education did not cause him to be puffed up. In fact, he said the Lord gave him a thorn in his side after he was raptured or whatever happened to him to keep him humble, whatever that was. Okay. On the other hand, Peter's lack of formal education did not give him an inferior inferiority complex. Okay. When you see people highlighting education in the Lord's service and lording it over others, that's a superiority com complex. But when you see someone saying, you don't need that Bible college, the apostles didn't have a Bible college, you just need Jesus, that's an inferiority complex. Neither one are from the Lord. Now remember, it is more difficult for an educated, clever, affluent person to get saved than another person. So it's harder for them to get saved to begin with. Secondly, <coughs> once they do get saved, they're going to experience a more difficult breaking by the Lord in their lives. They may have new motives, but the new motive is not good enough, even though it's good. It's not, I was a barrister or a Shakespearean actor, now I can be an evangelist or a preacher. No, being a barrister does not make you a preacher. Well, you know, I'm a medical specialist, consultant. Now I can be a medical missionary. No, being a specialist consultant does not make you a medical missionary. I went to a conservatory, I know harmonic theory, no, being an accomplished musician does not make you someone capable of leading worship. <laughs> Can God use those things? Yes. After we experience the breaking of the Lord in our lives to trust him instead of our natural abilities, even though the natural abilities themselves may be God-given or are God-given, we have nothing we haven't received. So it's more difficult for people of privilege, education, etc., to get saved. And once they do get saved, they will in some way experience more of the breaking of the Lord in their own lives. Before God can use their human background, they must learn to trust him instead of their human background. Now, I can tell you that, but it's something only the Holy Spirit can teach. <laughs> I had to learn it for myself. I mean, I can, a Bible expositor can perhaps tell this to somebody but only the Lord can teach it to somebody. The third is, where much is given, much is expected. <laughs> you've got money, you've got education, you have business ability, you have the... God's going to expect more from you. Paul did not have it easy, did he? No, he did not. So Apollos is one of the second generation who were more upwardly mobile than the previous generation of leaders with the partial exception of Matthew, who was good with numbers, he had to be because he was a Roman collaborating tax collector, we don't see too much intellectual prowess by the others per se. But the next generation is different. Okay. We go on looking now at Priscilla and Aquila. 
Whenever God uses a woman, her head will be covered. The Lord does not circumvent his order of divine authority. Where there's a Priscilla, there will be an Aquila. Where there is a Deborah or a Yael, there will be a Barak. Where there is an Esther, there will be a Mordechai. Conversely, where there is a Jezebel, there will be an Ahab. You understand? <laughs> the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Leadership is male. Can God use women? Absolutely. He used Esther. He used Yael. He used Deborah. Here he used Priscilla with their head covered. And I'm not talking about a veil or a hat. Those are only cultural emblems. I'm talking about what it means because of the angels, women being more vulnerable to spiritual seduction than men. Remember, because of the fall, men are plagued with insensitivity. And because of the fall, women are plagued with hypersensitivity. The male antenna being too short, the female antenna being too long. This is the reality. When Adam and Eve sinned, Jesus, it was Jesus, God came in human form walking in the garden. Adam, Adam, where art thou? What's going on? Oh, the woman, the woman. Now I'm talking to you, Jack. You know? <laughs> The woman fell first, I'm talking to you. Yes, God will use a Priscilla. He uses Priscilla's today. He uses Esther's today. He uses Deborah's and Yael's today. Scripturally. But this Jezebel thing with the feminism of the world coming into the church, wrecking havoc on the body of Christ as well as secular society, this is not God. This is the world. So that's the background. He accurately was teaching the Word of God. There was absolutely nothing wrong or deficient in what he was teaching or what he was preaching or what he, points of argument he was raising in his debates in the synagogue. Nothing wrong with what he was saying. Everything he was saying was right. His message and his ministry were only deficient in what he was not saying. You've got this, you've got this, you've got this, but where's the rest of it? Nothing wrong with what he said. But there was more to it that he did not know at that time. Unfortunately, things have not changed much. Everything I've done since the Lord called me to go into the ministry, well, I, not the evangelistic ministry, but certainly exposition of scriptures, has been to try to go back by the grace of God under the illumination of the Holy Spirit and understand the scriptures the way the first century church would have, which is a faith that is not Christian, but Judeo-Christian. You can't understand the New Testament beyond a limited point unless you understand how it fulfills the old. The same as a rabbi cannot understand the Torah unless he understands how it's fulfilled in the Messiah, Jesus, the Christian cannot be on the limited point understand the New Testament or even the Gospel unless he understands its messianic fulfillment of the old. And so we have it. How would the early Christians have understood the Gospel itself? Why did it get dark when Jesus finally died fulfilling that prophecy? And what was happening when it did? I look at three questions further. One, why do we take the Lord's Supper with bread and wine? First question. 
Why do we think we'll supper with bread and wine? Second question. Why in his death, his crucifixion, does Jesus not fulfill one, but two Hebrew holy days from the book of Leviticus concurrently? Why does he fulfill Passover, but also in part Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement? Why is there both the lamb and the goat? That's the second question. Third question. Why is the blood of Jesus never mentioned once in any of the crucifixion narratives until after he is dead? Only is his blood mentioned posthumously. After his arrest in Gethsemane, that's the last time blood is mentioned. Now we know when they crucified him and they drove the nails through the radius, the crown of thorns, there would have been blood. But it's never mentioned. It's never mentioned in any of the Gospels. Blood is never mentioned once in the crucifixion narratives. Not even once until after the Lord is already dead. Those are three questions. Our understanding of the gospel in Britain, in the Western world generally, certainly in Scotland, is very much framed by the Protestant Reformation. Think of the Reformation, as you've heard me say, as being in the character of the church of Sardis, of the flesh. I've not found your deeds complete in my sight. What you said was right, you heard the truth, but you didn't go far enough with it. Our understanding of the gospel that comes from the 16th century Reformation is predicated on the five solas. You may not have heard of the five solas, but if your pastor went to Bible college or seminary, he did. Our understanding of the gospel is based on the five solas. Let's begin looking at the five solas. Almost everything was in Latin in those days. Sola Scriptura. The only basis of doctrine is the scripture. Now the original reformers said this, but in praxis, it varied how much they actually observed it. John Calvin being the exception. John Calvin had nothing to do with the Reformation. He was two generations later. When Erasmus' Bible was published in Greek, which precipitated the Reformation, he was not born yet. When Luther nailed the 95 Thesis to the wall, he was a little boy. He had nothing to do with the Reformation. He came along later. While the Reformers were influenced by 16th century humanism that came out of the Renaissance, they went back to studying the scriptures in the original Greek and, and even Hebrew. John Calvin not. John Calvin kept to the Roman Catholic Vulgate of Jerome. He stuck to the Latin scriptures. Okay. And while the reformers said sola scriptura, John Calvin and his institute kept appealing to patristic authority by the authority of Augustine, by the authority of Augustine, by the authority of Augustine. John Calvin was not a true reformer per se. He basically reframed the Reformation with his Calvinism, with his reformed theology. But the first sola was sola scriptura. We can only base doctrine on the Word of God. Second.
sola fide. Only by faith. We're saved by faith in the completed work of Jesus in his death and resurrection. Only by faith. True. Sola gratia. Only by grace. It's unmerited. It's undeserved. In Hebrew, chesed, God's covenant mercy. In Greek, charism, it's a gift. We can't earn it. Roman Catholicism taught that grace was an ethereal substance earned by sacraments. <laughs> How can you earn grace? <laughs> it's a misnomer. Okay. Then... Sola Christe, only Christ, only what he did. We can't save ourselves. He has to be the savior. And finally, as Mr. Bach used to write at the end of his compositions, Sola Gloria Deo. Only to the glory of God. These are the five solas, the five major ones, five solas, upon which the Reformation and the understanding of the gospel that came from the Reformation was based that exists to this day. Salvation by grace through faith, justification, sola scriptura, sola fide, sola gratia, sola Christe, Sola Gloria Deo. All of these things are absolutely true. All of it is 100% true. There's nothing in it that is not true. But if you showed this to a believer in the first century who got their doctrines from Paul or Peter or John or James, they would have said, yeah, that's right. But where's the rest of it? We don't want to add to the gospel. But we dare not take away from it. Where is the rest of it? There is a clip visible on YouTube of the American Baptist John MacArthur saying, teaching, that we're saved by the blood of Jesus, we're saved by the death of Jesus, that the death of Jesus equals the blood of Jesus, and the blood of Jesus equals his death. That's the teaching of John MacArthur. Is he right or is he wrong? We're saved by his death. We're saved by his blood. He says they're equal. They mean the same thing. They're simply synonyms, essentially. Is he right or is he wrong? The apostles would have said, he's absolutely wrong. In Roman Catholicism, apart from the priest, the people normally take the Lord's Supper only with the bread. Because they think, like John MacArthur, the blood, the body and blood are the same. No, no. When Jesus inaugurated the new covenant at a Paschal Seder, this is my body, this is my blood, too, bread and wine. And so we look at this question. Well, that's right. But where is the rest of it? How would the first century Christians have looked upon the crucifixion? How would the first century church have understood these things? They wouldn't have disagreed at all with sola scriptura, sola gratia, sola fide, sola Christe, sola gloria Deo. They would have agreed with all of it. 
But that would not have framed their perspective. No, to the people who got their doctrines from the apostles, which should include us. Our faith is apostolic. It's not patristic and it's not reformed. We don't get our beliefs from the Reformation and we don't get our beliefs from the Church Fathers. We get our beliefs directly from the New Testament. You have the Paschal and the Levitical. The Paschal and the Levitical. It is primarily First Corinthians <laughs> that is the apostolic explanation of the Paschal, the Passover. It is the epistle to the Hebrews, which some people, including Luther, speculated that the author was, in fact, Apollos. Lutheranism teaches that Apollos wrote Hebrews. The Levitical is explained in Hebrews. What are we saying? <coughs> does anybody, I don't want to sound like a broken record, does everybody, does anybody not understand how Jesus primarily fulfilled the spring holy days in his first coming and the autumn holy days are fulfilled in his second. Does anybody not know what I'm talking about? You don't. Okay. The feasts of Israel in Leviticus 23, 24, okay. They're a picture of what a theologian would call Heilsgeschichte, salvation history. In his first coming, Jesus fulfills the sp three spring holy days in a primary sense. Passover, as the Passover lamb, the Feast of First Fruits, he raises from the dead on the Feast of First Fruits, and then the day of Pentecost seven weeks later. Hag Shavuot, we'll look at this a bit tomorrow. He fulfills those holy days in his first coming. Then, at his first coming, he only partially fulfills the three autumn holy days. You have a partial fulfillment of Rosh Hashanah, which was actually the Feast of Trumpets in his first coming at the Pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5, where it says it was the Feast of the Jews. That was almost certainly Rosh Hashanah. The, okay. Second, the Feast of uh, Tabernacles is fulfilled in uh, John chapter 7, where they took the water and poured it out. That was a, a ceremony called Simcha Bet Shoeva. They would take the water from the pool of Siloam, walk up the stairs to the Temple Mount, and pour the water out on the Temple. Now, what's described in the New Testament, in the Mishnah and in Josephus, is now proven by archaeology. The original pool of Siloam is about 80% excavated now, and the stairway that they would have had the procession on is 100% excavated just about. It's amazing. Archaeology continually proves the authenticity of the New Testament. It was one of the things that demolished liberal higher criticism, who said that the Gospels were written at a later point by non-Jews, and the authors had far too much familiarity with first century Judaism for it to be written by non-Jews at a later point. Be that as it may, in John 7 you see a partial fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles, okay? Um, but the ultimate fulfillment of it is in Zechariah 14, the millennium. The nations will come to Jerusalem and celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, okay? Tabernacles is one of the only two feasts celebrated during the millennium. 
Okay. He partially fulfills it in his first coming. And we're told in Hebrews, he partially fulfills Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, in his first coming, as the high priest in Hebrews. Now, let me explain this. Again, most of you know this, but we have one or two who don't. Very briefly, and I'm giving you the nutshell version for the sake of brevity, okay? The high priest would lay his hands on two goats that were selected to be identical in weight, size, age, etc. He would symbolically impart the sin of the people onto the goats. Originally, one was released in the wilderness, the other was sacrificed. But a goat released in the wilderness came back. And so they began to kill it by pushing it off of a cliff by the time of Jesus. The high priest would wear certain vestments once a year only for the Day of Atonement. Only once a year he'd go on back of the curtain into the Holy of Holies. That's what John the Baptist's father was doing as the high priest when he had the revelation that his son was going to be the harbinger of the Messiah. In Luke, you understand? That's what John the Baptist's father was doing, Zacharias. Once a year, he'd go on back of the veil. He had this white tunic with a sash that was scarlet wrapped around his waist. Based on Isaiah 118, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow, putting two portions of the Mishnah together, of, of Jewish history, from that time together. Not one, you have to put two, actually three together. They cut the sash in half. Now we know this from a tractate called Yoma, Yoma, about Yom Kippur. And they would tie one half to the horns of the goat that was released in the wilderness. The other half would be hung before the Holy of Holies. Based on Isaiah 118, if the sins of the Jewish people were forgiven on the Day of Atonement, it would turn from scarlet to white. But we're told, by putting these two portions together, it did not turn white for 40 years before the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. In other words, according to Jewish history, from the time of Jesus to the time the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, as predicted by Jesus and Daniel, the sins of Israel were no longer forgiven on the Day of Atonement. It never turned white. This goat that was chosen for the Lord was sacrificed in Jerusalem. And the high priest would again, once a year, bring his blood into the Holy of Holies. The other goat was called the Sa'er Ezazel. Sa'er Ezazel, which is an ancient Hebrew title of the devil. Okay? The Ezazel had to die after the goat that was for the Lord. The goats were led through Jerusalem in a procession. The people would spit on them, kick them, throw stones at them, and beat them with sticks, cursing them for their sin. A type of the, obviously, the Via della Rosa, of the, the crucifixion procession of Jesus. Okay. The Azazel would then, after the first goat was dead, be taken a distance of 90 stadia, a fair distance, into the wilderness of Judah and be pushed off a cliff and killed. You understand? The second goat would die after the first. That's the Azazel. In his first coming, Jesus was the goat that was for the Lord. You understand? Satan will be destroyed at his second. He partially fulfills the autumn holy days in his first coming. He totally fulfills them in his second. He fulfilled enough of them in his first coming so people wouldn't be able to say he's not the Messiah. But their ultimate fulfillment, the destruction of Satan, the establishment of the Messianic kingdom, and also the time of Jacob's trouble, the blowing of trumpets and so forth, the prophecies of Joel, those things have to happen at the end even though they had a partial fulfillment in his first coming. Are oh, you with me so far? You pretty much got it? We have tapes and things on the internet explaining it again in greater depth. 
Now remember in Nazareth, when Jesus was reading Isaiah 61, remember? And they tried to throw him off the cliff? Well, we know what time of the year that was. It was after, it was the time after uh, Tisha B'Av, after the day when the temple's destruction was commemorated. But it was the time when Jews were looking forward to the autumn holy days, to Rosh Hashanah, as we call it now, Feast of Trumpets, Yom Truah, and then the days of awe, the ten terrible days, we look at that tomorrow, and then Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, okay? So we know that was the time of year it was happening. But they tried to throw Jesus off the cliff, remember? But he evaded them supernaturally. The Father protected him. They had the wrong goat, you understand? He doesn't go off the cliff. That's the judgment of the Azazel. They had the wrong goat. They tried to say he was evil and throw him off the cliff, but they had the wrong goat. He was the other goat that was for the Lord who had to die in Jerusalem. You understand? Every, does anybody not understand? Okay. Now, we have a partial fulfillment of Yom Kippur on the day of the crucifixion. A partial fulfillment. When we read the book of Numbers, chapter 12, we see something interesting. That a Jew could eat the Passover with either a lamb or a goat. Oh, maybe it's Exodus 12. With either a lamb or a goat. Why could you eat a goat? We all know about the Passover lamb. Why could you instead have a goat on Passover? Because he would partially fulfill Yom Kippur. You understand? The focus was on the lamb. But you could also have a goat. <laughs> Both were there. So, in the Paschal, We have the lamb in the Levitical, the goat. Okay. Let's continue. On the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, the way Jews would have salvation in the Old Testament is Kapora. Yom Kippur comes from Kapora. If they had real faith and real repentance, if it was genuine and sincere, the blood of the goat would make Kapora, would cover their sin until the Messiah came and removed it. They would be gathered to their fathers, to the bosom of Abraham, if they died. Okay, and wait for the Messiah to come to remove the sin that was now covered. They had a temporary provision, but they could not enter into eternity yet. Okay. Uh, they were in eternity, but they couldn't enter paradise yet. They were in the bosom of Abraham. Okay. Okay. So the Paschal aspect of the crucifixion, the Paschal and the Levitical. The Paschal comes from the Hebrew word Lehakriv. Lehakriv. Will we get the word Korban? Korban. Passover. Korban. That which is sacrificed is the korban. Remember Jesus rebuked the Pharisees, anything that had been given to my parents is, is korban? Same word. That sacrifice given to God. Passover is the korbanic aspect of the crucifixion. 
the sacrifice. The Levitical is the kaporic. The kaporic from le kaper to atone. Our word atonement was invented by William Tyndale, and it was a brilliant invention of a word, at one mint. <laughs> okay. Le caper. There had to be a sacrifice before there could be kapora. This comes to the body and the blood. In the Paschal aspect of the crucifixion, Jesus dies for our sin. He pays for what we did in the brokenness of his body. His body is destroyed as a korban to pay the price for our sin. But that's not what makes atonement. The high priest had to enter the Holy of Holies and apply the blood to have atonement. The high priest could not go into the Holy of Holies and apply the blood unless the body was already dead. He had to lay hakriv before he could lay kaper. Hence Jesus In the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians 11. Ze gufi shani espar badchem zotasu lezikroni. This is my body broken for you. The matzah, the bread, is striped and pierced, corresponding to the flesh of the Paschal Lamb. My body is broken for you. Okay. But then he takes the cup after supper and he says, Hakos Azot, he a Brita Habasha, Zedami, Shanir Spach Badhem, Zot Asu Lezikoni, this is my blood poured out. The blood could only be efficacious once the body was dead. His blood could only avail for us once he paid for what we did. You understand? Where it says the blood justifies, it does. Only because he first paid for what we did. We're justified by his blood because he paid for what we did. The high priest could only apply the blood and make kapara once the korban was sacrificed. You understand? Now let's look at Matthew chapter 26. Verse 27, when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from this, okay? All of you, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many to the forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Okay. 
In the Paschal aspect, the bread corresponding to the body. Looks to the past, to what he did. It looks back. But he tells us, I'm going to drink this anew with you in my father's kingdom. The blood in the Levitical aspect of the crucifixion looks to the future. When Jews eat the Passover Seder, they look back to the redemption out of Egypt and forward to the redemption of the Messiah. We are the same. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You understand? No, the body does not equal the blood. The blood cannot avail till the body's dead. Well, let's go further with this. When Jesus hangs on the cross, Pontius Pilate puts up the sign, Jesus Christ, King of the Jews. King of the Jews. Only the Messiah, as most of you know, only the Messiah could be both king and priest. When King John Hyrcanus in the intertestamental period, the Hasmonean era, basically, was a high priest who made himself king, that's when Judaism really became corrupted. After the Maccabees. There was one king in the Old Testament who tried to burn incense in the temple. God smote him with leprosy. A king had to be a descendant of David from the tribe of Judah. A priest had to be a descendant of Aaron from the tribe of Levi. Okay. Only the Messiah could be both. Now again, most of you broadly know this. Although Jesus was legally a descendant of David, he was pre-existent and he's called the Shortish Ishai, the root of Jesse of David's father. But legally, he was son of David. So too, although legally he was also Levitical, as I'll explain in a moment, from the tribe of Levi, he was of a different order, the order of Melchizedek. Okay. But legally, it's a fact that his first cousin was the son of a high priest. How could he, being of the tribe of Judah, have a first cousin, relatives, his aunt, of the tribe of Levi? When you study the daughters of Zelophehad in the Old Testament, when a Jewish woman married cross-tribally, she took on the tribal identity of her husband. Although Mary was a descendant of David, her family was a mixture of the tribes of Levi and Judah. Okay? I won't go into it now, but the Talmud tells us Miriam Bateli, even the rabbis affirm that Luke's genealogy is through Mary and Matthew's is through Joseph. Now it's more complicated than that, involves love and right marriage and the curse of Jeconiah. I'm just scratching the surface of this. It's... Maybe we should just have a whole conference on the genealogy sometime. However, Luke is Mary's, Matthew is Joseph's. Okay. He was biologically born for Mary, so he still was a descendant of David. Luke is a matriarchal genealogy, Matthew is the patriarchal. Luke is the universal one, going back to Adam. Matthew is the Judaic one, going back to Abraham. Okay. 
Luke is the priestly. Matthew is the royal. Everyone understand? Only the Messiah could be both king and priest. Now in Christ, we're all kings and priests. Only he's the king of kings, the Melech Hamlachim, and he's the high priest. But there's the priesthood of all believers and we're all kings. But he's the king of kings and he's the high priest. Everyone understand? Well, now let's go further with this. Pilate puts up the sign, Jesus Christ, King of the Jews. The king was dying for his people. But he was also the high priest making blood atonement on the altar. Look with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 9. Verse 16. For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead. It's never in force while the one who made it lives. The high priest had to die. In the Paschal aspect of the crucifixion, it is the death of the king. In the Levitical aspect of the crucifixion, it is the death of the high priest. Everyone understand? Lord's Supper is with bread and wine, body and blood. Mr. McCarthy is wrong. It's not six of one, half dozen of the other by any means. In the Paschal aspect of the crucifixion, Jesus is passive. In the Levitical aspect, when he enters the Holy of Holies, of which the earthly one is a mere copy, Jesus is active. In the Paschal, it was what was being done to him by the Romans at the behest of the Sanhedrin. It was passive, like a lamb led to slaughter. In the Levitical, it's active. He is applying the blood on our behalf, making atonement. Everyone understand? Look with me, please, to the Gospel of St. John, chapter 19. Verse 34, please. But one of the soldiers, see, he was already dead. Notice he was already dead in verse 33. In verse 34, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. That is the first time blood is mentioned in any of the passion narratives. In any of the accounts of the crucifixion, the blood is only mentioned after the korban is dead. He could not make a pair until there was a korban. There was a need to leha kriv. Everybody understand? That's the first time the blood. 
Quite a number of years ago, as a young believer with considerable interest and even fascination, I read a book about when the Torin Shroud was investigated scientifically for the first time. It was reinvestigated some years later. But the first time a number of experiments were done in a number of countries. The British were looking at pollen and trying to see if the pollen recovered from the shroud could be dated back to the Middle East in the first century. Amazing that they can do that. The Americans were looking at the shroud as a photographic negative. It was NASA, the American Space Agency, were looking at the physics of it. The British were looking at the botanical biology of it. And the French were looking at the medical pathology of it. They kept cadavers respirating. They were brain dead, of course. They were cadavers. But they kept them respirating on artificial life support systems. And they crucified these cadavers, Roman style. And then they did autopsies. They did postmortems on the cadavers. And they were trying to medically determine what Jesus would have died from clinically. And their conclusion was he died from pericardial effusion and hypovolemic shock. That's what would have killed him. And they explained what it would have been like having the nails through the radius. The diaphragm could not expand to facilitate respiration without pulling up. It, it was just un you couldn't think of a crueler way to kill somebody. And he did it not just for all of us, he did it for each of us. If you or I were the only ones who ever sinned, which we're not, but even if we were, he would have went through that just for you or for me personally. He didn't just die for all of us, he died for each of us. He would, God would have become a man and went through that just for us. I don't need to know about self-worth and that's, that's the price God values me at. I don't need to worry about self-esteem. I need to worry about self-debasement. <laughs> well, let's look at this now. When you have those combination of factors resulting in the death, you had an accumulation of water and blood in the lower thorax. And it meets, the medical evidence meets the gospel account of stabbing through the ribcage and the blood and water coming out, which has a symbolic meaning, obviously, of the two covenants, flesh and spirit, and so forth. However, again, we don't base doctrine on typology, but we know Jesus was the last Adam. When, Jesus, when Adam went to sleep and God took the rib out of Adam and made the woman, and then Adam woke up again, it was a picture of the death and resurrection of Jesus and the church coming out of Christ, and so forth. Well, it happens and the blood shoots out. Okay. That's the first time the blood appears. After he is dead, it says. Seeing that he was already dead, they didn't break his legs, which fulfills an Old Testament prophecy. Okay. He had to be dead before the blood could show up. Now, there was blood, but it was not recorded. And it was obviously... There might have been internal hemorrhage, but there was no external bleeding of a hemorrhage-type volume. Just bleeding from the thorns and the Roman scourging and so forth. But when he was dead, the blood shot out. Okay. Look with me, please, to Hebrews. Now, even the first covenant had regulations of divine worship 
and the earthly sanctuary, for there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one, in which the lampstand on the table and the sacred bread, this is called the holy place. On back of the second veil, there was the tabernacle, which is called the Holy of Holies, the Kodesh Kodeshim, having a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden jar holding the manna, Aaron's rod, which budded, and the tables of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim and of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. But these things we cannot speak now. We're just told that they're shadows of what was in heaven. And we're told in verse 11, but when Christ the Messiah appeared as a high priest of the good things to come. Notice good things. Not the bad news. Atonement is good news. The gospel is the good news. Besora, evangelion. It's not the bad news, it's the good news. The Paschal aspect was the bad news. The Yom Kippur aspect was the good news. Okay. He entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation. <coughs> not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood he entered the holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption, which of course demolishes the false gospel of Roman Catholicism. <coughs> Nonetheless, notice what happens. Once he dies, he enters the Holy of Holies. It's no longer passive. The Paschal is passive. The Levitical is active. The Paschal is the death of the king. The Levitical, the death of the high priest. The temple veil was torn. Look with me, please, to Matthew. Chapter 27, verse 51. Behold, the temple veil was torn in two from top to bottom. Okay. That is kapora. That is at one mint. Sinful man is no longer separated from holy God. Okay? That is kapora. Let us look very briefly to Mark's gospel. Verse 33 of Mark 15. The sixth hour came darkness over the whole land, once again, as in Luke, until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In fulfillment of the prophecy of Psalm 22. And we read once again when this happened, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom in verse 18. Jesus screams out various things on the cross in his agony. One of which he commends the welfare of his earthly mother, Miriam, to the Apostle John. And another, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. The ultimate high priestly prayer. Okay. Here, he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But it's an Aramaic, not Hebrew, not Greek. This shows the humanity of Christ. We know from when black boxes are recovered from aircraft tragedies, crashed aircraft, that although by international convention the language of Aerial navigation is English. In a crisis, people revert to their mother tongue. 
he was no different. He speaks Aramaic. He spoke the Galilee dialect of Aramaic. Probably the closest thing to what we have existing to what he spoke is something called the Peshitta text. The Peshitta text. But I leave that to one side. I only mention it briefly in passing. So the temple veil is torn and he cries out for the last time to tell us die, it is finished. Paid in full. In the Paschal aspect of the crucifixion, it is the completion of the Old Covenant. It is finished. The Torah shows through the example of Israel and the Jews that all have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God. We can never meet his standards. We can't even keep the Ten Commandments. Every one of us is a liar, a thief, etc. It's the completion of the Old it is finished. The lamb is sacrificed. Remember Moses could only apply the blood to the doorposts and lentils once the lamb was dead. I long to drink the cup, but we will do it new in my father's kingdom. This is the cup of my blood of the new covenant. The Levitical is the Inauguration of the new. It is finished. The completion of the old. He fulfilled the law perfectly. To God, one man without sin is worth more than all the people with sin. That's how Jesus could die for all of us. of the old. That's the Paschal. The cup of the new covenant. The inauguration of the new. Okay. So we know why we take the Lord's Supper with bread and with wine. Why he fulfilled simultaneously two Hebrew holy days on the same, on the same day. And we know why there's no mention of blood in the Passion narratives and the crucifixion accounts until he's dead. The Korban had to be dead before the high priest could apply the blood. The Paschal and the Levitical. The First Corinthians explains the Paschal. Hebrews primarily explains the Levitical. Now there are other passages, but primarily. The lamb, the goat, the korbanic and the kaporic, the body and the blood, the past and the future, the king's death, the high priest's death, the passive and the active, the completion of the old, the inauguration of the new. It gets dark very dark. Fulfilling the prophecies of Amos 8 again. Nobody could do anything. But when it gets dark and nobody could do anything, Jesus was doing something. In the dark, it was all passive. As we would see it. But as God revealed it to us in Christ, is the active. As we'll begin exploring tomorrow, a time of spiritual darkness characterized by everything from political and economic chaos to moral disintegration. 
of an unprecedented, historically unprecedented scale is going to happen before Jesus comes. The Antichrist will be manifested. These things are going to happen. It is going to be very dark indeed. Work while you have the light. Night will come, no man can work. A time is coming when we won't be able to preach the gospel anymore. The Holy Spirit will no longer be restraining evil or convicting men of sin. The time of the Gentiles will begin to draw to a close. The age of the church per se will be finished. God will revert to dealing with Israel and the Jews, but in the darkest hour of their history. It will not be a happy time. It's going to be very dark. Nobody can do anything. Well, this tells us two things. One, we should be working now while we still have the light. But two, when it gets dark, don't worry. No, we can't do anything. But Jesus will be doing something. God bless. See you tomorrow. <laughs>